Thank you all for, for joining and I uh, hope everyone had a, um, at least for uh, the Canadians, a good um, long Thanksgiving weekend. Um, we had a little bit of snow here in Calgary, which is um, pretty typical for this time of year for us. My name is Ian Bonsma. I work for HTC Engineering. Um, I will be presenting uh, this Workplace Noise 101 webinar. Um, expect it to uh, run about a half an hour and then um, I'll stick on afterwards for um, some questions, uh, if there are any questions, and uh, hopefully we can answer them for you. So I'll get uh, rolling through this. So thanks again for joining. Um, if you cannot hear me currently, please um, raise your hand. Um, there's a little hand button um, that you should be able to access in the uh, one drop down menu from Zoom. Uh, there are some sounds that are played in uh, this presentation. Um, we'll try to uh, just be mindful of that when uh, they come up. The volume should be similar in level to uh, what my speaking is now. Um, by default, all listeners uh, have been muted. So if you do have a question, um, please uh, enter them in the, the Q&A board and we'll address them um, generally at the end of the presentation, um, unless I see something that uh, pops up um, during the presentation uh, as well. So who am I? Uh, I've been working in noise, vibration, and acoustics for about 15 years. Um, I'm the senior associate and the Western Region Manager for HTC Engineering. Um, I'm uh, located and based in Calgary, um, Alberta. I am registered as a professional engineer in, in a number of provinces, as you can see there. Um, and I have experience in uh, most aspects of, of noise, vibration, and acoustics. Um, particular focus on building acoustics and environmental noise, and then, uh, you know, dabble a little bit in workplace noise, um, and certainly structural vibration sort of at the early part of, of uh, my career with HTC Engineer. So why do we care about workplace noise? Uh, noise exposure in workplace, it's regulated. So uh, in Canada, federally through the Canada Labor Code and um, through provincial regulations. So um, Alberta's Occupational Health and Safety Code or Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, in the United States, um, it's regulated through the Occupational Safety and Health Act and uh, NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, um, provides some input on uh, what applicable limits are for um, the U.S. Uh, federally as well as through some of the states. Um, what you may see uh, is there are some, some corporations that uh, set limits that are sometimes lower um, and they do this as a best practice and to reduce exposure to legal claims. So you may see, uh, you know, an internal limit of, of 80 dBA instead of 85 or, or 90 dBA. Why else do we care about workplace noise? Well, well, hearing loss is, is a big one. Um, like many of you, uh, you know, my parents and certainly my grandparents, um, you know, have difficulty hearing. Uh, and this comes from from many years uh, working in noisy environments, uh, you know, agriculturally, my, my, my one grandfather, um, you know, near tractors all the time. And then uh, my father worked in a, a manufacturing plant for 30 years. So, uh, you know, mid 90s, they really started wearing uh, hearing protection through all activities. So it's not so bad now. But um, the other reason, you know, it leads to lost time incidents at work. Um, worker illness, injuries, um, as well as um, interference with communication. So missed warnings, um, instructions, you know, costly mistakes in production um, due to missed instructions. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a primer on the science of sound first, uh, and then we'll get into a little bit about um, workplace noise uh, and calculations and how you can come up with, um, you know, workplace, uh, a worker's exposure. So what is sound? Sound is uh, air pressure fluctuations. So it's in the range of 20 to 20,000 fluctuations per second. Um, you can see, uh, you know, a graph on the right hand side here and, and then, you know, a, a picture of a drum here. And so what you'll see is, is the amplitude of the fluctuations will increase based on loudness. So every time you're, you're beating the drum, you're making, um, you know, some, some noise in the environment. So the increase uh, of those fluctuations um, increases. And so sound pressure level is, is the envelope of those, uh, those pressure fluctuations. So if we have a nice steady sound, um, it's relatively straightforward to figure out you know, what is that sound pressure level. 
Um, if we have a varying sound, so it's increasing and decreasing in loudness, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to um, figure out what that sound pressure level is. And shortly I'll present how we determine, you know, what is the average sound level from um, a sound level like this that is varying over time. So our audible range of loudness um, is immense. It's, it's more than a factor of a million. So from 20 micropascals to more than 20 million micropascals. Um, so we use a logarithmic scale uh, and it uses units of decibels. So the sound pressure level, LP, uh, in decibels is defined as 10 times log to the base of 10 of the sound pressure over a reference pressure and that's squared. And our reference pressure in this case is 20 micropascals and that's the equivalent of zero dB, which is essentially the threshold of hearing. And there's unlikely uh, too many of you that have seen uh, or been in an, an environment where uh, you've even experienced sound levels of 15 dB or, or less uh, because there's very few environments um, in the world that have sound levels that are that quiet. Um, here's a, a typical scale that you might have seen in the past. Um, you know, threshold of hearing is zero dB. Um, you know, a silent library or maybe a quiet room in your house, uh, you're closer to 30 dB. Normal conversation at about a meter is about 60 dBA. And then, uh, you know, some other examples here, you know, an old gas powered lawnmower, um, 90 dBA. Um, they've gotten much quieter now with battery operated ones. Um, you know, a gunshot or firecracker, you know, you're going to get uh, fairly acute. Um, you know, damage from, from that 140 dB, um, those very short duration events can cause uh, permanent damage. So one thing to note, a, a gunshot is 100 billion times more powerful than a quiet house. And so we use a log scale to, to better represent, um, you know, sound levels. It'd be difficult to be explaining the difference between a gunshot and a quiet room in, in such large numbers. So a couple of interesting, uh, points to keep in mind, <clears throat> a change of less than three dBA is, is imperceptible and a change of plus or minus 10 dBA equates to a doubling or halving of perceived loudness. So these are, are uh, important to keep in mind when you're um, looking at noise control or um, you know, increases in sound levels from um, adding new equipment to a space. And, and we keep this in mind when we get involved, um, a change of less than three um, involved in uh, complaint, noise complaint investigations for, you know, environmental noise or workplace noise as well. You know, if you're only looking to make a change of less than three, um, it's generally, it's not going to be perceptible to, um, you know, that, that concerned person. So um, you're looking to try to make a change of 10 or more. Here's another scale of uh, typical dB ranges for regulatory limits. So often um, environmental noise limits um, to avoid risk of disturbance, annoyance, you know, loss of enjoyment of property is generally in the 40 to 50 dBA range. Um, the, uh, the workplace noise limits um, in general are between 85 and, and 90 dBA. So in addition to differences in, in level of sound, so how loud something is, you know, our ear can also detect differences in frequency, so tone and pitch. And frequency is the rate of pressure oscillations, so faster oscillations are higher frequency, uh, slower um, oscillations will be lower frequency. And we measure this in, in hertz, um, which is cycles per second. So thunder, um, you know, would be lower frequency sound, you know, 60 to sort of 100, 125 hertz range. Um, and then crickets, uh, which you'll definitely hear um, in the summertime, you know, 4,000 to 6, 7,000 hertz. Um, and it depends a little bit on temperature um, in terms of what their dominant frequency um, is going to be. So just a couple examples of, of some frequency sound here. So we have a tuba on the left-hand side, um, and I'm going to play a little sound here, and it's kind of lower frequency, so we have some slower oscillations. And on the right-hand side, you know, a flute or a piccolo, it's much higher. So there's two examples of, of sort of different frequencies that um, are in our audible hearing range. Um, so this uh, is just an example of, you know, a, a, a quartet. 
So it's a nice sort of rhythmic pattern, you know, it's harmonic, it'd be relatively pleasant for us. Um, and then here's an example of, of, say, a noisy environment. So a construction site, you know, we have, uh, there's no rhythmic pattern here. It's just random spikes and peaks. Um, it wouldn't be very soothing and it's typically quite annoying, uh, particularly when, you know, they're at elevated levels and, and our background sound is quiet. So, you know, for instance, uh, you know, in Calgary right now, they're building a, a massive roadway and, and Sunday mornings, there's still construction, but it's very quiet. And you could hear the pile drivers um, going at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, for a pretty good distance away. So our, our previous graphs showed fluctuating sound pressure level over time. Um, here we're looking at sound pressure level um, versus uh, frequency and, and many, many frequencies. So this is um, often referred to as a narrow band or fast Fourier transform um, spectrum. Um, and it's showing a complete description of the sound. So separate dB levels for every frequency. Um, in this case, um, it's every 1.5 Hertz, um, we have a measured sound level. So it's a, you know, sound is very complex. It contains many different frequencies, some with, with little to no sound. So you can see kind of here in the uh, 4,700 Hertz range, you know, there's very little sound, less than 15 dB. And then other areas where we have, um, you know, some tones, so around 890 Hertz, um, as well as, you know, a pretty significant peak um, around 6,000 Hertz, uh, which in this case uh, was due to the dominance of insects. So we use this analysis method, um, you know, narrow band to identify uh, sound sources. So we call this acoustic signature. So this 890 Hertz um, tone right here uh, may be related to one specific piece of equipment you know, operating in a neighboring industry. And so we can take that, um, that level and be able to go then to the industry and identify whether or not, um, you know, that is a specific noise source and can we do anything about that, uh, that noise source if it's the cause of complaints. So, you know, there's lots and lots of data here, you know, it's pretty unwieldy to, to assess, um, use this for assessments, you know, it includes thousands of dB levels. You know, moreover, you know, looking at this, what is the overall sound level for this, um, this spectrum, this spectral shape, you know, and how can we compare that to other spectrums that we have? I mean, it's very difficult to determine, you know, what the overall sound level of this is, you know, just by looking at it, um, even for, for experienced acousticians. So, you know, we take this and plug it into, uh, you know, into a spreadsheet program and we could come up with an overall level from that. So there's several ways to compile or condense this information, which um, I'll present in the following slides. So the most, most common way is um, an A-weighted spectral sum. So, you know, our human ear has a defined sensitivity um, and it's not equally sensitive to sounds of different frequencies. So for instance, if we use the, the tuba and the piccolo that, that I played sounds from earlier, you know, the tuba is kind of in the the 100 hertz range and the piccolo is, you know, higher 2000 to 4000 hertz. Um, you know, if they're played at the same loudness, our ears would be able to to pick out the piccolo a whole lot better than the tuba. And um, for this, the difference in sort of what our ears perceive is about 20 dB between those two. So a sound level meter, um, you know, can weight the sounds at different frequencies and sum them all up. And, and you may see this um, you know, on sound level meters, there'll be a DBA, uh, you know, weighting setting that you can set it to, and it will provide the DBA level. And we can also do this um, in spreadsheets and, you know, by calculation. And so using an A-weighted sound level, you know, we can compare two sources of sound. So, you know, the piccolo and um, the tuba, we can compare those two sounds in terms of, you know, how we uh, humans perceive them. So our, our ear is not equally sensitive to all sounds, you know, lower frequency sound we're less sensitive to um, versus higher uh, sort of speech frequency sounds, which we're fairly sensitive to because, you know, our, our key uh, is communication and speech. Um, we apply the A-weighted curve uh, to the levels at each frequency and sum them into a single number that gives us this DBA level. Um, and it's a good descriptor of um, the loudness of the sound for us. So we use that for uh, a lot of environmental noise regulations uh, utilize DBA. Um, 
correlates well with the potential of sound to cause disturbance or annoyance in the community, so it's environmental noise, um, or risk of hearing damage, so in workplace noise environments. So here's a, another important uh, approach to assessing um, sound levels. Uh, we use octave bands. And so we aggregate all of the very fine frequency data. So that, that data that's in one Hertz um, widths into um, typically eight octave bands. So from 63 Hertz to 8,000 Hertz, which generally represents our uh, human hearing, the range of human hearing. And so we, you know, these are eight is kind of a manageable number of buckets to put all of the frequencies in the audible hearing range. Um, into for analysis and uh, you know representing data to um, in reports or for modeling, um, and you may have seen uh, you know these type of specifications on on mechanical equipment for fans, um, you know acoustical performance specifications for noise control, you know such as mufflers or silencers. Um, we use it for we use these octave bands for modeling, um, and in special cases it's important to have um, this octave band information to specify. Um, hearing protection devices. And I see, see a couple of questions here. Um, I will uh, get to a couple of those in a few minutes. So before we um, move on to another important concept, uh, just a quick recap. Uh, we talked about, um, you know, the loudness of sound magnitude, you know, our frequencies, how our ears and auditory system can hear low and high frequency sounds. Uh, a weighting, which is a single number descriptor to help with assessing sounds and octave bands, you know, how do we manage or organize the multitude of frequencies um, into manageable bins? So we'll talk um, a little bit about time-weighted average exposure. Um, and this is what you'll see on lots of workplace noise um, assessments. So except for very loud, you know, short duration sounds, you know, explosions where a sound pressure level might be uh, 140 dBA, um, our risk of hearing loss is, is not related to a, a short instantaneous sound pressure level but to cumulative exposure over a very long time period. So, you know, eight hours a day, a 40 hour work week over our working career. So to assess workplace noise, um, you know, we need a measure of sound exposure and, and what does that look like? Well, for a steady sound on the left-hand side here, the exposure level is easy. You know, it's, it's the steady sound level for the duration that the worker is immersed in that sound. So if it's 75 dBA for the entire eight hour shift, the exposure is 75. However, what if we have, you know, something like this on the right hand side, where we have a sound level that's increasing and decreasing in magnitude, um, and maybe the duration of time that the worker is there, you know, it's not eight hours, it's, it's maybe a 12 hour shift. You know, how do we, how do we address that? How do we deal with that? So there's several ways, um, but for workplace noise, the general approach is a time weighted average. Um, and Average in this case is a bit of a misnomer uh, because it's not an arithmetic average. It's, uh, you know, because we're dealing with decimals, decibels, so it's um, logarithmic. So it would have been better to say uh, time-weighted exposure um, rather than time-weighted average, but we'll stick to time-weighted average um, going through this presentation. So there are different forms of, of a TWA um, in different jurisdictions with different sets of decibel limits that apply. And we'll talk about the two most common ones in the next few slides. Um, in essence, all of the schemes um, determine a TWA from a time varying sound level, um, you know, and they amount to summing up the acoustic energy over a specified duration. And, and we put that into a number that represents how much sound occurred during that time. So if this is representative of somebody's entire shift, the one on the right hand side, you know, we're going to essentially add this up, come up with an average, and, and that'll be the, the time weighted average for that person's time. So in the United States um, Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, the current guideline uses a 5 dB exchange rate. And, and Barb, this may go to uh, your questions here um, between this slide and the next couple. So um, OSHA has a limit of 90 dBA uh, over an eight hour workday, and it assumes you know, daily exposure five days per week um, for the length of, of a typical working career. So you can see from this, as we increase 5 dBA, um, the exposure limit decreases uh, in half. So if we are in an environment that's 95 dBA, we can spend four hours there. If it's 100 dBA, we can spend two hours. And that is a 5 dB exchange rate. So if you measure the sound 
in the workplace with a sound level meter, um, or we put a noise dissimeter on a worker to assess exposure, we need to set the instrument to have a 5 dB exchange rate in order to measure um, in accordance with this current um, US OSHA requirement. Um, the way that the instrumentation applies this 5 dB exchange rate and what it means in terms of our graphs of sound level um, is complicated uh, and a little difficult to explain. Uh, however, we will do some uh, do so for the case of the other common TWA scheme, which is a 3 dB uh, exchange rate. So this uh, 3 dB exchange rate is the recommended or future guideline um, and other progressive jurisdictions, uh, many provinces in Canada um, use a 3 dB exchange rate. And uh, with this, an 85 dBA limit um, for eight hours. So similar to um, the previous table, uh, we're going to see a 3 dB uh, change here. So when we go up to an environment that's 88 dBA, we have to have our time um, in that environment um, up to 91. Again, we're having our time in there down to two hours. So the 85 dBA limits and 3 dB exchange rate, you know, correlates better to avoiding risk of hearing loss. It's certainly more stringent, conservative, safe. Um, this scheme has been adopted by some um, US jurisdictions and many in Canada and elsewhere. Um, and because it's gaining wider acceptance uh, and because the math is a little bit simpler um, than the 5 dB exchange rate, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna go through a, a quick example of this uh, shortly. And for a 3 dB exchange rate, the time weighted average is equivalent um, to the LEQ. And I will um, explain what an LEQ um, is shortly. So LEQ, so how do we represent this time varying sound pressure level um, you know, that's varying in loudness over time? So we, we use a term which is called uh, the energy equivalent sound exposure level, so LEQ. And it's like an average, but it's a logarithmic average. So we take the, the sound energy and we're averaging the energy rather than, than the dBA level. So it is the hypothetical steady sound level that would contain the same energy in a given period of time as the actual time varying sound. So why do we use an LEQ? It correlates well with potential of sound to disturb, annoy, or fatigue individuals. Um, it correlates well with the potential of long-term sound exposure in increasing the risk of hearing loss. And therefore, you know, it's the basis of most workplace and environmental noise regulations. So when I referred to DBA before, if I said 85 DBA, it's typically an LEQ, an energy equivalent sound level of 85 DBA over that person's you know, work shift for environmental noise regulations. You know, it would be 45 or 50 dBA, but it would be an LEQ. For those that like equations, you know, here's a formal definition of LEQ. You can see here that um, it's a type of average. Uh, we integrate the squared sound pressure over time and over the total duration of the time. But the average occurs inside a logarithmic function. So it's not like a, a common arithmetic average. And for those who don't like equations, you don't need to remember this. Um, virtually all modern acoustical instrumentation, sound level meters, uh, can perform this function automatically. Uh, and it's called an integrating sound level meter or an integrating dosimeter. Here's uh, just two different ways that we can measure um, a time weighted average directly. So we can use a dosimeter, um, which is a small sound level meter that can be um, put on the shoulder. Uh, of a worker, or we can use an integrating um, sound level meter. And we can use an integrating sound level meter um, at fixed work locations, uh, you know, for a stationary worker at a workstation, uh, we can place that sound level meter beside the individual and measure over a shift and know the TWA directly. Um, dosimeter, you know, you put on the shoulder of the, the worker and they can wear it for the day. Um, some caution with this, uh, traditionally dosimeters are prone to overestimating the, the actual TWA. Um, this is because um, they'll include spurious sort of pseudo noises um, close to the microphone. So, you know, bumps on it, uh, rustling from clothing or the worker's own voice. Uh, and we are gonna talk a little bit more about that and, and you know, how to deal with um, some of that in our uh, webinar number three on high definition um, dosimetry. In, in webinar number two, uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons of you know, using a dosimeter versus uh, using a sound level meter uh, for doing 
uh, workplace noise assessments. With either of these methods, um, the measured TWA at the end of the shift can be compared to the allowable limits from the times, you know, from the tables shown previously. Uh, you know, I guess, but what if we have a mobile worker or we don't have access to a decimeter? or if we have different sound levels at different times of the day or different stages of the process, you know, and we don't own an integrating sound level meter. So we'll need to use separate measurements of, of sound pressure or, you know, the LEQ along with some math, um, decibel math to calculate uh, a shift total, a TWA manual. So before we do that, uh, very quickly, we're gonna talk a little bit about decibel math. So two plus two equals five. So decibels do not add or average um, arithmetically in the usual way, but log logarithmic logarithmically. So if we have two sound levels, X plus X, you know, they don't add up to two X, but rather X plus X equals X plus three in decibels. So if we have two sounds, each of 50 dBA, they sum to 53. And we must use logarithmic addition, not arithmetic addition. So one common notation for this is using two plus symbols together. And so 50 plus 50 in terms of dB is 53 dB. So a little bit more about decibel math. So if we have two sound levels, 50 and 40, and we add them together, we essentially still get 50 dB. So when we're adding two dB, value, two dB values where one is 10 dB greater than the other or more, the lesser sound effectively does not increase the total. And this is because we're, we're energy adding these. And so, you know, in reality, um, that 40 dBA is adding a, a minor amount, um, you know, 0.4 to that 50. So we have a nice handy table on the side here that you can use when, when adding two sound levels. So when the difference between the two is 10, you know, we add 0.4. When the difference is zero, so 50 and 50, we, get, we add three to get to 53. And here's some, uh, another equation for those that like equations. So I'll, um, just a couple minutes left here, but I'll, I'll quickly go through uh, a worked example of a, a time-weighted average calculation. And so a uh, lovely word problem um, that we can go through. So John works in a plant for eight hours. He spends time in the following locations with the measured sound levels as indicated. You know, how can we calculate a TWA for an eight hour period? So John spends you know, four hours um, at the sorting line, which has an average sound level of 80 dBA, you know, 87 in the packaging line. He's there for an hour, some secondary, secondary sorting. You know, he's two hours there, it's fairly loud, 91. And then one hour you know, in the break room between his lunch and his breaks, um, and we have 55 dBA. And so how do we go from, from these sound levels to come up with, with a, a TWA? And so going back to, to some math and aggregating a series of time-weighted average Sound levels, you know, we want to take our LEQ. So for instance, the first time period of, uh, of 80 dBA, you know, we're there for four hours. So 80 dBA is the LEQ and we're there for four hours, T1 over our, our duration of our time in this case would be eight hours. And so we'll make those adjustments to each one uh, of those four sort of activities. And so that's made here. And so you'll see that four hours, if we remember, you know, we're using a three dB exchange rate. So in an eight hour day, it would be 84, but it, since it's a four hour, we're adjusting by three down to 81. And we do that for each one of these activities. And then what we do in terms of calculating a TWA for the entire shift, we're adding all four of these sound levels together because now they're all based on an eight hour time period and we come up with 87 dBA. And if we want to combine all of that together in one big equation, uh, we can utilize this equation, um, which we would use in spreadsheets. And I see that there's a bit of a typo in this. This divide 10 should not be a subscript, but um, like the other ones here. So quickly, some key elements of a workplace noise assessment. You know, we want to identify worker locations, you know, the activity type of activities, you know, potential time for each function. Uh, then we want to conduct sound level measurements, either through dosimetry or a noise map using a sound level meter. And we'll get to that um, in webinar number two in, in a couple of weeks. Then we want to tabulate um, our time-weighted uh, average for each of our workers or, you know, produce a noise map if we're, if we're just interested in where the noisy environments are and we need to put signage up. Um, we'll use a noise map 
if we find excesses over the limits, uh, then our next step is a workplace noise control feasibility study to determine, you know, what noise control can we uh, put into place to help quiet down that working environment. So what did we discuss? You know, why workplace noise, um, why a workplace noise study is required? You know, what is sounds? What is DBA, LEQ, you know, frequency, A weightings, octave bands, you know, narrow band analysis a little bit. Uh, we talked about exchange rates, 3 dB versus 5, um, and what a, a time-weighted average is and, and how to calculate it for a 3 dB exchange rate. So just a minute or two about who we are. Um, we're one of North America's largest acoustical engineering firms. Um, we were founded in 1994. Um, our head office is in Mississauga, Ontario, uh, which is one of the most tightly regulated jurisdictions in North America um, with respect to noise. Um, and we also have a branch office in Calgary. Um, Alberta has very similar um, noise, environmental noise regulations um, to Ontario. Uh, we get involved in, in essentially all noise, vibration, and acoustics, uh, you know, built environment, industrial environmental noise, industrial workplace noise, in industrial vibration, um, transportation related noise, you know, airports, roadways, railways, uh, you know, on their, their impacts on, on buildings and residential. Um, defense and security and, and product um, research and development. Um, we get into lots of different um, uh, product development where, uh, you know, they're trying to quiet things down or, or just assess um, the sound levels from uh, various pieces of equipment before it goes, you know, they try to sell it or market that product. Uh, and here's some, uh, you know, photos of various uh, places that we've been and some of the clients we've worked for in terms of environmental noise or workplace noise. And questions. And I think we're just shortly past 30 minutes here. So I will um, thank you for attending. Uh, and I will go through some of uh, the questions here. Uh, can you come back to 10 dBA being doubling versus regulatory assumptions of three or five? And see, Barb had another. So even though noise technically doubles at 10, the regulations have a safety factor such we assume a five or three. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, we're moving closer to um, 3 dB uh, for most jurisdictions now because it, it tends to be a little bit more uh, conservative, um, you know, for workplace noise. Um, and so we, we see most jurisdictions using that and even the recommendations or the future guidelines for the US um, are moving away from the five. And, and you know, partly that that is maybe to uh, it's a little easier to understand the 3 dB doubling and, and know what the sound level meter or dosimeter is doing uh, versus five and because there's a little bit more math uh, that goes into the 5 dB uh, exchange rate. Um, not sure if you're coming to this. Can you explain dBZ rated and C rated? Right. So if I go back to um, this A weighted curve here. So this is this is for DBA, um, DBC, uh, DBG, uh, uh, B. There's there's lots of different weightings that are out there. Um, DBC uh, has less um, emphasis at the lower frequencies, so it tends to uh, you get a higher level from it uh, than than you would from from a DBA rating. Um, DBG, which which some of you may have heard of, um, that tends to focus on very low frequency sounds, so below 100 hertz down to about 10 hertz, um, so almost in the infrasound range. Um, dBZ is typically um, referred to an unweighted sound level. So generally, um, a sound level meter can measure an unweighted sound level, so dBZ or um, dBA. I mean, some of the fancier ones will have other weightings that you can apply. But often when you're using a, a sound level meter, you'll see dBA and, and dBL or dBZ. And that is an unweighted sound level dBZ. So we're not applying any curve to it at all. So in fact, um, those low frequency sounds, you know, 31 Hertz or 63 Hertz, um, they're gonna uh, show up a lot more in a dBZ um, measurement than a dBA, but it's, it's not representative of what our sort of auditory system hears or how we perceive that sound level. I think. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through the, the comments and questions here. If anybody else does have a question, um, by all means, um, put it into the question and answer board here. Um, and I'll hang around for another uh, few
few minutes to go through uh, if there are any other questions. And thanks all for, for joining and taking the time uh, out of your day to, to listen to this.